be is going to be live streamed and the recording of the hearing will be available to be viewed online for some period of time. Please help those uh, viewing the hearing by speaking clearly, loudly, and one at a time. Do not interrupt another speaker, and when needed, I or one of my co-panelists may stop the hearing process to remind you or to ask for clarification. Uh, I see that the live stream has now started, so let me begin more formally. Welcome to the Office of Tax Appeals. Uh, we are here for the hearing in the appeal of Total PCS Solutions, Inc., which is Office of Tax Appeals um, case number or OTA case number uh, 1808-3554 and the appeal of One Stop Communications, LLC, DBA One Stop Wireless, which is OTA case number 1808-3559. Those cases have been consolidated for this hearing. Today is Wednesday, April 20th, 2022, and the time is approximately 9.33 a.m. This hearing is being held in Sacramento, California. Uh, today's hearing is being heard by a panel of three administrative law judges. My name is Michael Geary, and I will take the lead in conducting the hearing. I'm joined uh, on the panel by Judges Andrew Kui and Josh Aldrich. After the hearing, the three of us will discuss the arguments and the evidence. Each of us will have an equal voice in those discussions, and at least two of us must agree on the issues um, presented. Any of us on the panel may ask questions and otherwise participate in today's hearing to ensure that we have all the information needed to correctly decide this appeal. The Office of Tax Appeals is not a court. It is an administrative tribunal staffed by tax experts and is completely independent of the state's tax agencies. Now let's have the parties identify themselves by stating their names and who they represent beginning with the appellant. My name is Mitchell Stratford, and I'm representing uh, Total PCS Solutions Incorporated and One Stop uh, Communications, LLC. James Demler on behalf of Appellant as well. Thank you. And may I ask the representatives of California Department of Tax and Fee Administration to identify themselves? My name is Amanda Jacobs. I'm tax counsel with the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. I'm Scott Claremont with the CDTFA. I'm Jason Parker with CDTFA. Thank you, everybody. It's my understanding that there will be no witnesses testifying today. Is that correct, Mr. Stratford? That is correct. And am, am I correct, Ms. Jacobs? The department has no witnesses? Correct. Thank you. The exhibits marked thus far for identification in this appeal consist of Appellant's exhibits marked one through six for identification, consisting of approximately 159 pages, and respondent's exhibits marked A through Y for identification and consisting of approximately 678 pages. All exhibits have been previously disclosed and discussed. The parties provided copies to each other and to OTA, and OTA staff incorporated all proposed exhibits into an electronic hearing binder which should be in the possession of the parties and my colleagues up here on the dais. Mr. Stratford, have you confirmed that appellant's exhibits incorporated into the binder are complete and as legible as the ones that you submitted? Yes, I have. Thank you. And Ms. Jacobs, have you also confirmed that? I can confirm. Thank you. Neither party has raised any objections to the proposed exhibits or indicated that there were any problems with the proposed exhibits as they appear in the binder. Ms. Jacobs, am I correct that respondent has no objections to the admission of appellant's exhibits one through six? No objections, thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Stratford, am I correct that appellant has no objection to the admission of respondent's exhibits um, A through Y? That's correct. Thank you. All those exhibits are now admitted into evidence. The audit liability in this case is comprised of three significant areas, and it is my understanding that only one of those, reported service commissions, is at issue here. Um, there is a sing so there is a single issue to be decided in these appeals, and that is whether amounts paid 
by wireless service provider Metro PCS should be excluded from the appellant's respective taxable measures. Mr. Stratford, have I correctly identified the issue? Yes, you have. And Ms. Jacobs, do you agree? Yes. Thank you. We have discussed in pre-hearing conferences um, the logistics of this hearing and have agreed that appellants uh, which, uh, who have two opportunities to argue their position will have an opening argument that will be approximately 20 to 30 minutes that will be followed by respondents only argument of approximately 20 to 30 minutes followed um, at appellants option uh, by a closing argument of approximately five minutes. Uh, be advised everyone that the judges can ask questions at any time. Uh, they will let the parties know if they have a question about their arguments. Any questions before we begin the argument? No. Seeing nothing. Uh, Mr. Stafford, are you ready to proceed? Yes, I am. You may do so when ready. All right. Thank you, Judge Geary. Um, I'm appearing on behalf of One Stop Communications and Total PCS Solutions Incorporated. As you mentioned, there is a single issue at dispute with both of these cases. The issue at dispute is whether or not the sale of wireless service for a single month from which appellants receive a commission equivalent to the sale of the first month of service is subject to tax. The sale of wireless service is not tangible personal property, and as a result, the sale of wireless service by appellants is not subject to tax. Appellants made sales of phones which are tangible personal property and which are subject to tax. Appellants also made sales of wireless service on behalf of then Metro PCS, now T-Mobile, which are not. The transactions were separate and the phones and the wireless service are distinct. We will demonstrate that the measure pertaining to the commissions is directly and only related to the sale of wireless service. Because wireless service is not tangible, the commissions are not gross receipts as defined in Revenue and Taxation Code Section 6012. As a result, the commissions are not subject to tax and should be removed from the audit liabilities. <coughs> the first document that we would like to reference to support our position is Joint Exhibit 1. The exhibit is the relevant Metro PCS dealer agreement from the periods in question. The first page states in relevant part, dealers will keep the first month's service, including all features sold except insurance and the handset margin. In addition, the second page provided with Exhibit 1 outlines the dealer's compensation on the sale of the phones. The amount the customer pays is the price of the handset plus MRC, which stands for the monthly recurring charge or the wireless service, plus features. And the dealer compensation is handset margin plus MRC plus features, excluding insurance. The language in, in both cases is specific in its description that the dealer is compensated by keeping the first month of wireless service, the MRC or monthly recurring charge. The commissions at issue are directly tied to the sale of wireless service. Further, the dealer also gets to keep the margin on the handset and that is listed separately. The Metro PCS dealer agreement is evidence that the sale of the phone and the sale of the wireless service are separate and that the dealer, in this case appellants, are compensated separately for each. The next evidence that we'd like to reference is Appellant Joint Exhibit Number 3. Within Appellant Joint Exhibit Number 3, there's a v variety of sales reports from both, I believe it's um, February 5th, 2017 and May 1st, 2017. The reports include uh, a sales detail from, from two separate days that lists the total number of phones sold, including accessories, as well as wireless service. The evidence provided demonstrates the following. The sale of wireless service for a new Metro PCS customer, which is the matter under dispute, is a separate and distinct transaction in a, into a separate and distinct system, in this case the, the QPay system. The sale of wireless service is optional. In each of the days provided, there is an example of a customer purchasing a new phone without purchasing wireless service. The example that we provided is not from the periods under dispute. However, the policy regarding the commissions for the, the sale of the first month of wireless service is exactly the same as in the periods that are under dispute. And it continues to be the policy for T-Mobile dealers today. 
The Metro PCS Commission structure and the correct application of tax is also evidenced by other taxpayers who have been audited by CDTFA. In connections with our briefs, we submitted a BOE 836, which is Appellant Joint Exhibit Number 2, in which the principal auditor states, in this instance, the retailer is not required to reduce the selling price of the phone in exchange for retaining the first month service. Therefore, it is my recommendation that the amount assessed as recorded manufacturer rebates from sales of new phones with service plans be deleted from the assessed measure in the revised audit. Notably, this unrelated taxpayer was audited for the same periods at issue here by the same district office and is the same exact issue under review. Further, another Metro PCS dealer had a hearing with the Office of Tax Appeals regarding an unrelated matter. Through a Public Records Act disclosure, we acquired the working papers and the BOE 836 related to their audit. Similarly, CDTFA found that the Wireless Service Commissions were not subject to tax. In the audit working papers, they state, the commission model after the merger of T-Mobile on July 23, 2014 was examined. The taxpayer collects the first month service charge from the customer and receives this amount as a commission from Metro PCS. Mr. Stratford, can I interrupt you just for a second? Yes. The document to which you just made reference, is that in the exhibit package? Um, yes, it's joint okay. exhibits five and six. Okay, and, and you've been referring to them as joint exhibits. Didn't we decide earlier on that these were separate exhibits? They were simply your exhibits, appellant's exhibits? Uh, but by joint, what I'm referring to is both for Total PCS Solutions Incorporated and One Stop Communications LLC. It has a slightly different meaning here. Just refer okay. to them as your exhibits. Okay, by uh, 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 appellant exhibit um, five and six in this case then. I'm sorry. Thank you. <coughs> um, um, I've got to figure out where I was. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the working papers from the unrelated case that was heard before the Office of Tax Appeals. Um, the working papers state, um, the commission model after the merger of T-Mobile on July 23, 2014 was examined. The taxpayer collects the first month service charge from the customer and receives this amount as a commission from Metro PCS. The service charge is collected on new activations with the sale of a new phone and reactivations with no sale of phone. As such, the commissions received are related to a sale of service and accordingly not taxable. Requested the commission model of Metro PCS prior to the merger. The taxpayer was unable to find documentation for the commission model prior to the merger. For a discussion with taxpayer, this commission model was the same for year 2012 and 2013. This was accepted based on reviewing the overall markup factor and payments received for the third party rebates and commissions. Further, the 836 in connection with that case states, based on the commission model presented, the commissions received should be treated as non-taxable receipts. Even though the retailer receives the same amount as the first month service and the commis commission is considered a profit center for the retailer, the commission is related to the sale of a service because it is charged indiscriminately to all customers. Not only is the wireless service and the related commission clearly exempt from tax based on the nature of the transactions themselves, i.e. the service is not tangible, but CDTFA has already treated them as such in two other instances of taxpayers operating the exact same business from the exact same franchise for the exact same periods in one of the case for the exact same charge. All of the available evidence supports that commissions received by appellant for Metro PCS are connection with the optional sale of wireless service. As a result, we request that you find that the amounts be removed from the computation of the audit liabilities for appellant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stratford. Is respondent ready to give its argument? Yes, thank you. Let me interrupt just for a second. Um, do either of my fellow judges have questions for Mr. Stratford about his argument? I did have one question. This is Judge Kui. Um So uh, at the beginning of your argument, you were referring to um, your Exhibit 1, which was the summary of the dealer agreement um, for the compensation model. Um, and I was looking at page 3, and it listed the amount the customer paid as the price of the handset, and it listed the amount of the dealer compensation as the handset margin. And I was wondering if you could explain the difference between what the price of the handset 
versus the handset margin is in terms of the dealer compensation versus what the customer is paying for the um, the cell phone? Sure. Um, so if the dealer sells a cell phone for $100, um, you know, that would be what the customer pays, whereas what the dealer would retain in, in this would be the, the margin, the difference between the selling price, which let's just say was $100, and the dealer's cost for the phone, which let's say would be $80. So the, the margin would be the $20 difference. Does that make sense? Or are, you, are you asking for some other? Okay, that um, I see what you're saying. I, I just wasn't sure if that had anything to do with uh, um, the change in the billing of uh, getting the monthly service built into the price versus the monthly service being separated from the price in 2010. I'm not sure. Oh, you answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Do you have any questions? This is Judge Aldrich. Uh, no questions at this time. Thank you. Um, I have a uh, one question, I think. Am I correct that the portion of the we have a portion of the contract, but not the entire contract in evidence? That's correct. D do we do you have the entire contract? We don't. The the pages that we got from this agreement were actually from an old case file of the the unrelated account that we had the 836 from so we we weren't able to obtain the the full dealer agreement from 2010 from the our clients or the so you, so your client doesn't have the entire agreement either no. okay um, thank you mr. Stratford any other questions judges all right um, miss Jacobs if you're ready you may proceed Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. This is Amanda Jacobs for CDTFA. Both appellants in these consolidated appeals operate retail stores selling cell phones and related accessories in California. The sole issue in both appeals is whether amounts paid to appellants by wireless service provider Metro PCS, as determined by audit, are subject to tax. One Stop Communications was audited for the period of July 1, 2008 through June 30, 2011, and Total PCS Solutions for the period of April 1, 2007 through June 30, 2010. As relevant to this appeal, the Department established a, established a deficiency measure of unreported taxable commissions of $539,210 for One Stop Communications LLC and $602,566 for Total C PCS Solutions Incorporated. Appellants made retail sales of Metro PCS cell phones, which during the audit period were locked to the Metro PCS network, meaning that there was a technical restriction built into the phone by the manufacturer to restrict the use of the phone to the Metro PCS network. In performing the audits, the department noted that there was a decrease in the reflected markup factor on the sale of cell phones for both appellants in 2010. Based on the department's experience auditing other Metro PCS retailers, this indicated that appellants received rebates or commissions on phone sales. See exhibits J, M, V, and Y. According to the available evidence, in January 2010, there was a change in how Metro PCS cell phone sales were structured. Exhibits M, page three, V, page one, and W, page two. As appellants stated in their reply briefs, filed on July 12, 2019, prior to 2010, retailers like appellants charged a, rel charged a relatively higher markup on the sale of cell phones, approximately 60%, and the first month of wireless service was free. Then, starting in 2010, appellants charged a lower price for, this, for the phones relative to the price charged in 2009, approximately 20% markup, and the first month of wireless service was no longer free. This is um, seen in the total PCS July 2019 reply brief, page 3, lines 18 through 24, and one stop um, reply br July 2019 reply brief, page 4, lines 1 through 8. However, appellants received additional compensation for selling a phone in the form of commissions from Metro PCS as set forth in Appellants Exhibit 1. 
In effect, the total payment for the exact same transactions stayed relatively constant. An appellant's total compensation from the sale of a phone also remained basically the same as it was pre-2010. Neither appellant has provided any evidence regarding the commission amounts received from Metro PCS from January 1, 2010 through the end of the audit period, which is June 30, 2010 in the case of Total PCS and June 30, 2011 in the case of One Stop. And appellants have not provided any records of individual transactions within the liability period showing when a phone was purchased with or without activation. Total PCS July 2019 reply brief, page 3, lines 1 through 9. One stop, July 2019 reply brief, page 3, lines 11 through 18. The verification comments in Schedule 12 of the one stop revised audit work papers state the taxpayer did not maintain books and records adequate for sales and use tax audit purposes and that no documents were provided to support a change to the audit liability. Exhibit L, page 2. See also exhibits M, page 3, and N, page 1. Similarly, Schedule 12 of the Total PCS Audit states that appellant did not provide any information on the amount received from Metro PCS for the commission rebates in relation to the phone sales. Exhibit W, page 2. Because appellants did not provide any specific information about the commission amounts they received for cell phones sold after January 1, 2010, the department inquired with Metro PCS about the commissions paid to authorized dealers for each phone they sell. As noted in the Schedule 12 verification comments of the Total PCS audit, according to Metro PCS, Metro PCS pays the dealer about $40 for new account phone sales and $30 for existing account phone upgrades. The Metro PCS phone technology only works on the Metro PCS network, which results in customers prepaying for one month of service at the time of the phone sale. Exhibit W, page 2. This is also noted in Schedule 12D of the One Stop Audit. Exhibit V, page 5. Based on this information, the department estimated the measure of taxable commissions based on the number of phones purchased with an estimated average commission per unit of $40 for One Stop and a weighted average commission of $38 for total PCS. The department then multiplied appellant's purchase records by the commission amounts to compute unreported taxable commissions of the amounts I stated earlier. See Exhibits A, page 15, K, page 1, P, pages 8 through 9, and V, page 1. Pursuant to the Revenue and Taxation Code, sections 6012 and 6051, sales tax is imposed on a retailer's retail sales of tangible personal property in this state, measured by the retailer's gross receipts, unless the sale is specifically exempted or excluded from tax by statute. Gross receipts are the total amount of the sales price without any deduction for labor, service cost, or other expense. That's section 6012, subdivision A2. Per 6012, subdivision B2, gross receipts include all receipts cash, credits, and property of any kind, and there is no limitation that the receipts must be received from the purchaser directly. A retailer's gross receipts are presumed to be taxable until proven otherwise, and the burden is on the retailer to establish that its retail sales are not subject to tax, section 6091. Here, appellants are retailers of cell phones, not sellers of service, and the amount received on the sale of a phone is presumed to be taxable. Based on the information obtained in the audit, the department correctly concluded by preponderance of the evidence that these amounts, which included commissions, did in fact constitute gross receipts. Appellant's primary contention is that the commissions were not for the sale of the phone, but rather a sort of finder's fee for signing a customer up for service. Appellants have argued that there is no commission if appellants does not, did not sell a, a wireless service. Um, however, appellants have not produced any evidence to support this con contention, and in fact, the single relevant document they have provided, Exhibit 1, indicates that these amounts are in fact gross receipts from the sale of the phone. Exhibit 1, 
a more readable copy of which is included in the hearing binder as Exhibit G, consists of two pages from a Metro PCS agreement which appellant asserts was applicable to the period in question. The second page details the amount of compensation de dealers received for certain service activities, including new activation, reactivation, handset upgrade, and Metro Flash. For new activation, the dealer receives, in addition to the margin or profit from the sale of the phone, the monthly recurring charge, or MRC, plus the charge for any features. The MRC can range from around $40 to $60. See Exhibit 1, page 2, and Exhibit H, page 5. For a handset upgrade, that is when an existing customer purchases a new cell phone without any activation of service, the dealer receives, again, in addition to the margin or profit from the phone, $40, a $30 MICRA plus $10. For reactivation, which appears to mean when a customer who at some point stopped their service resumes service without purchasing another Metro PCS phone, the retailer receives $13. See Exhibit 1, page 3. As I stated, a handset upgrade involves an existing customer. It does not involve the finding of a new customer or the activation of service. The $40 commission a dealer receives for a handset upgrade cannot be for anything other than the sale of a phone. This fact alone clearly corroborates the information received from Metro PCS on which the audit determination is based. Appellants generally received a $40 commission on the sale of a cell phone. As a whole, the compensations for the different service activities provided a provide a framework that is entirely consistent with the information received from Metro PCS. As I just stated, on the, activate, on the sale of a phone to an existing customer, a handset upgrade, retailers receive $40. For reactivation, when no phone is sold, the retailer receives $13. And on a new activation, which involves both the sale of a phone and the activation of service, the dealer compensation can range from $40 to $60 and upward based on the value of any other features purchased by the customer. Taken together, there is a consistency to the values placed on the various service activities and that the compensation for the combined transaction is generally consistent with the compensation received for each individual transaction. Finally, we note that for new activations and handset upgrades, the chart indicates that the dealer receives the handset profit as well as any other compensation components. In other words, it indicates that a single person the dealer who sold the phone receives all the compensation. There is no indication whatsoever in Exhibit 1, and specifically in the chart on page 3, that separate retailers would receive different portions of the compensation. And as I've previously stated, appellants have not provided any evidence of that being the case from their own books and records. So to summarize, appellants have not produced any records from the audit period regarding the actual transactions at issue to support their assertions. There are no records showing that they did not receive a commission on certain sales, and there is no evidence that they received a commission for activating phones they did not sell. And as I've just explained, the one relevant document they have provided, the Metro PCS Agreement, Exhibit 1, is consistent with the audit findings and in no way supports their contentions. Total PCS Solutions did provide documents from two days in 2017, well after the periods in question, which include an X report, sales transaction summary, sales transaction detail, QPay online reports, including a summary report and transaction detail, and individual invoices. None of these documents provide evidence in support of appellant's position. The only information provided by the QPay online reports, for example, is of payments made by customers into the QPay system. Exhibit 3, pages 6 and 7. There is no information in these documents related to the compensation received by the dealer from Metro PCS. There is also no evidence that appellants received a commission for activating phones they did not sell. We also note that Metro PCS was purchased by T-Mobile in 2013. Therefore, these records relate to transactions involving an entirely different company, and appellants have not produced any evidence indicating that the terms applicable to the sale of a T-Mobile phone in 2017 were the same as those applicable to the sale of a Metro PCS phone during the audit period. 
Exhibits three and four show deeply discounted phones being taxed on the full price, which indicate that this is a bundled trans transaction, a different type of transaction from the ones at issue. And in fact, documents appellants submitted suggest the commission model after the T-Mobile merger was different than the transactions at issue, or at least there was no evidence that they were the same. See Exhibit 5, page 11, and Exhibit 6, page 3. For example, appellants cite Exhibit 6 in their arguments, which is an audit report for a different taxpayer in a different audit period with different facts. Firstly, conclusions made in another audit are not evidence and have no precedential value. The application of tax is based on the evidence presented in this appeal. In addition, the audit report says the dealer received a commission from Metro PCS equivalent to the first month's service charge on both new activations and reactivations, Exhibit 6, page 3. Based on app Appellant's Exhibit 1, however, we know that the commission model in we know that is not the commission model in this case. Although a customer may pay the first month service charge upon activation or reactivation, Exhibit 1 clearly indicates that the dealer compensation for activations and reactivations differ, and that the dealer compensation for reactivations was only $13, or $11 plus $2, Exhibit 1, page 3. So again, while an audit of another taxpayer is not evidence, or precedent in this appeal, we note that it also appears to be based on a conclusion that is clearly contradicted by the evidence in this case. In sum, the audit determinations before you are reasonable based on the available evidence. Appellants are cell phone retailers, and the evidence shows that the commission amounts received were additional consideration from Metro PCS for selling phones. Appellants have made many claims to the contrary, but have not produced any evidence to support their contentions, and the single relevant document they did provide, Exhibit 1, indicates that the commissions are in fact gross receipts from the sale of the phone. Appellants have not met their burden of proving the commission should be excluded from their respective taxable measures. For these reasons, we request the appeal be denied. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. Um, Judge Quee, do you have any questions? Yes. Judge Aldrich, do you have any questions? Hey, this is Judge Aldrich. I have a, a couple of questions for the department. Um, the department re made reference to Exhibit W, page 2, uh, and there's a $30 upgrade. Is that uh, interpreted to mean um, an upgrade for TPP? So say, for example, a iPhone 3 to an iPhone 4, or is that an upgrade in service where, for example, you would want uh, you know, 10 gigabytes of data as opposed to five. Just a minute, let us, let us find that page. Okay. I believe it's page 1575 of the combined PDF. We, we would um, read that as a phone upgrade since it says existing account phone upgrades. So n not like service upgrade, but a, but a phone upgrade. Okay, thank you. And then on uh, exhibit A, page 18, States, we note that taxability of the commissions is not based off of Regulation 1671.1. Does the department maintain that position? So we don't necessarily agree with the decision that these transactions aren't covered by Regulation 1671.1 Subdivision C3. Um, 1671.1 does not exclude or exempt items from gross receipts that would otherwise be a part of res gross receipts and it's not an exhaustive list. Um. Yeah, I, I, I think we agree that 
this is based on the application of RTC 6011 and 12, the definition of gross receipts. Um, regulation 1671.1 is discusses when there's um, specific um, reduction in price on a transaction by transaction basis, and it, and it discusses when that occurs, whether it's taxable or not taxable, but it doesn't exclude situations where there's not a specific reduction of price on a transaction by transaction basis. It's, it's, it's not exclusive to, it's not saying that the gross, the definition of gross receipts are exclusive to that. It's just when that happens. 1671 is telling you when it's taxable versus when it's a, simply a reduction in price that reduces the, the gross receipts. Thank you. Um, and uh, I do have a question for appellant. Um, so you had mentioned that the exhibit one uh, was sourced from an unrelated appeal. Correct. Um, I guess my question is, how do we know that exhib exhibit one sourced from an unrelated appeal is the actual contract in place for the appellant at that time? Um. It's a Metro PCS agreement. There's no dispute that appellants operated Metro PCS retailers. The agreements for the relevant time period, I don't, I don't know why it wouldn't be applicable. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Thank you, Judge Aldridge. Judge Quee, do you have questions? Uh, yeah, I did have one question um, for CDTFA. You had mentioned that there was a reimbursement of approximately $13 paid when there was no phone um, purchase. It was just like a, a, a reactivation. And then like if it was um, bundled with the purchase, then there was a higher MRC, you know, it could be like 40 or $60. I'm, I'm wondering in the audit, did you um, make any allocation or take into any account that there was a potentially a portion of it was allocable to, you know, like if uh, the selling of the one month of wireless service versus their did you have the entire charge allocable to the sale of the phone and, and picked it up as an entire charge as taxable related to the sale of the phone? So it's my understanding that um, when creating the taxable measure, we took the purchase records and multiplied that by the um, by the forty dollars or thirty eight dollars, and so that wouldn't that wouldn't capture reactivation because it was multiplied based on the phones that that the appellants purchased. And, and and I would also point out that I don't I don't believe that this document was available at the time of the audit or wasn't produced at the time of the audit. So it was the the forty and the thirty dollars was based on just the information from Metro PCS as documented in the audit work papers. It wasn't based on this formula specifically. But they they go to I mean yeah, but I mean, but we but we think this formula corroborates essentially that that the information was correct or at least close to correct. Okay, um, and I guess just a quick follow up: what um, to the extent that you know there is a different charge for if you only purchase one month of service without getting the phone versus if you get a phone plus the one month of service, would the CDT have a, CDTFA have a position that the charge paid when uh, the commission paid, the MRC paid, when you have the month of service plus the phone that's entirely taxable or would the position be that there'd be some allocation for non-taxable service versus TPP? Again, it's it's not based on the, you know, it was based on the the, met, the information from Metro PCS, which was that the commission on the sale of a phone is forty was forty dollars on a new activation. This exhibit one indicates that it's that the actual full compensation is more than forty dollars because it could be forty plus it could range the MRC could range from forty to sixty, and then the the other features could increase that to more than sixty. Uh, I think to the extent that these are locked phones and um, the these are locked phones and so essentially purchasing the phone includes the you know like it's it, it isn't necessarily it's it's not a optional um, part of the the payment that to to activate the phone it is part of gross receipts I think we accept the the estimate we received from Metro PCS that it's forty dollars and not 40 to 60 plus more because then you start getting into truly optional upgrades that are not 
required to activate this locked phone, which is only available to be used on Metro PCS network. So that so again, this was based on what was told to us by Metro PCS at the time of the audit, but it is consistent with this formula because if they were to choose other features, those would truly be optional features that were chosen. Okay, thank you. I don't have any other questions. Thank you, Judge Quee. Uh, Judge Alders, anything else come to mind before I turn to the appellants? Uh, no further questions. I, I wanted to ask the appellant something before you gave your final closing. Is, is there any dispute that these were all locked phones that were sold by yes, the clients? Yes, Yeah, that's not my understanding at all, actually. Um, actually, in our, our reply brief, um, what our client said is that um, this was a uh, briefing data. Tell me what you're reading from or going to yeah. read from. It's a briefing submitted by us on July 12, 2019 um, so in response to a request for additional briefing from Office of Tax Appeal. The question that was posed to us was, can a Metro PCS phone be activated with another service provider? Um, the statement our client provided was, yes, the Metro PCS phones can be unlocked by a third party or a knowledgeable customer and used on a different network. During the time of the audit of Metro PCS, uh, or during the time of the audit, Metro PCS was a CDMA code division multiple access network. So the phones could have been used on any other CDMA network, for example, Verizon Wireless. Further, currently, T-Mobile is a GSM, Global Systems for Mobile's network. So a Metro PCS slash T-Mobile customer could use a phone on an AT&T, also GSM network, if the phone was unlocked. Um, let me ask you this. Is there anywhere in the evidence that's been admitted um, an indication of whether or not um, your clients offered activation with other service providers? They did not. They did not. Okay. Thank you. Are you ready to proceed with your final closing? Our final argument. Oh, I just Jacobs, want. Did you have a question? I just wanted to speak to the phone locking, if you would allow me to do so. All right, you're going to make reference to some evidence about that. Yeah. All right. Yes. Sorry. Um, just you know, contentions made in brief are not evidence. Um, the evidence in the audit received from Metro PCS is that phones were locked, um, and it's our understanding that until 2014, it was actually illegal for customers to unlock their phone. Um, the Unlocking Customer Choice and Wireless Competition Act was signed into law on August 1st, 2014, um, which repealed rulemaking, determined, uh, rulemaking determination by the U.S. Copyright Office that made it illegal for people to unlock their cell phones. And, and you indicated, Ms. Jacobs, that in the audit, the department was so advised that these were, these were locked phones. Can you refer to um, an exhibit or a page number where we can confirm that? Um, I believe it's in, I don't have a specific page number for you, but I believe it's in um, several of the audit comments. So I would check exhibits J, M, V, and Y um, to find those specific comments. All right. Thank you. Judges, any questions come to mind for you? I'm ready. Okay. Are you ready, um, Mr. Stratford, to give your final closing? Yes, I am. You may proceed. Okay. Um, so first I would say uh, CDTFA makes several references to the evidence available in this case. Um, you know, we have the agreement from the time period in question. The agreements for, the, like, the CDTFA states that the other cases aren't evidence, but the comments in those cases reflect the exact same type of transaction that we're dealing with here. So it's evidence that the nature of the transaction that we're describing is what occurred. Um, they sell wireless service, they get a commission for the wireless service. Um, both the other cases reflect that. I don't even know if there's a dispute as to that's what's occurring. You know, it's the primary issue. If the sale of wireless service for which appellants receive a commission in the same amount 
is subject to tax if they also sell a phone. Um, I, I don't know what evidence contradicts that in this case. Um, regarding the sales records and, and things of that nature provided for this case, we're not disputing the amounts. The amounts are materially accurate. Um, so any additional records that might you know, adjust the amounts upward or downward slightly, I don't, I don't think are really relevant to whether or not these commissions are subject to tax in the, in the first place. Um, regarding whether or not the phones are locked and whether or not they have to activate on a Metro PCS network, um, I don't actually think that that matters. Um, the fact that the wireless service is optional, as evidenced by the documentation that we've provided, I think makes it extremely clear that it's not gross receipts. Um, but even if they were required to operate on a Metro PCS network, which we don't agree that they were, um, you know, there's, there's precedent in this regard, specifically, you know, the Dell case, um, wherein, you know, they were examining you know, sales of computers with optional maintenance contracts. Um, and in that case, what the court found is that sales tax could not be assessed on the service contracts component of the sales because the service contracts were not tangible personal property. In this case, I don't think there's any dispute that wireless service is not tangible. Um, and two, the value of the service contracts was readily ascertainable and therefore deductible from the taxable portions of the sales. Um, similarly here, the wireless portion of the sale is readily ascertainable because it's separately stated in this case even, um, and it's an ongoing charge that they pay every month to maintain their service. Um, so even in the instance that they are required to, uh, you know, activate with Metro PCS, then it, it's still a, it's still not tangible and the value of it's readily ascertainable and it's it's not subject to tax. Um, it's really that simple. And I, I would just say it's so simple that <laughs> on other taxpayers operating the same things, the issue is relegated to some comments, and that's it. Uh, there's no assessment. So um, and that's coming from the CDTFA on other cases that we had no involvement with. Well, I guess the first one we did have involvement with, but the second one we didn't. Um, so there's no way that we could, you know, potentially argue that for them to influence the outcome on this case. Um, we all have cell phones. We all have wireless service. None of us pay tax on wireless service. Um, it doesn't even make sense that the retailer would charge, in theory, if the department were right, which, you know, obviously we dispute, the retailer would charge tax reimbursement on the sale of wireless service when they sold the phone. That, and then on the next month, the wireless service would not be subject to tax, and not, then there would be no reimbursement charge from Metro PCS. Um, I, I think it's just clear that wireless service is intangible and, and not subject to tax. Um, and I think that's well evidenced. Or not that wireless service isn't intangible, but that the commission specifically that they receive are for the sale of wireless service is well evidenced in the documentation that we've provided. And then that's corroborated by, you know, CDTFA audits of the same exact franchisee for the same periods in one instance, later periods in another, um, where the commission model's the same. So from our perspective, it's quite straightforward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stratford. Um, judges, anything further? I don't have anything. Nothing further. Uh, thank you, um, uh, everybody, for appearing here today. Did the parties, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Stratford, you submit the matter? Excuse me? Do you submit this matter? Yes. For decision, Ms. Jacobs? Yes, I did want to give you a citation that you asked for. Exhibit W, page 2. Great, thank you. Big, but otherwise, yes. All right, thank you. The record's now closed uh, in this hearing. Um, I'll thank you again, everybody, for participating. In the coming weeks, the panel will meet to discuss the matter, and we will send you a written opinion within 100 days. Um, this is uh, the conclusion of this hearing. Uh, however, there will be another hearing to follow. There will be a recess for those who might be watching this live stream. There will be a recess of approximately 15 minutes. 
Thank you again, everybody, for being here this morning. Thank you.